Hello there. This is my walk walkthrough of, uh, I've been going through something, the show I'm currently showing in Margate's Pie Factory. We've got five paintings in this room. The three you can see, which are, there is a certainty to melting snow, a bit of medicine, and meltdown at St. Mary's Bay. Um, this painting here, there is a certainty to melting snow. Um, was probably one of the first paintings I did, as well as the Cliff is a Dizzying Place to Meet, which is further in the exhibition. Um, and this was actually started in London, rolled up and then brought down to my studio here and completed here. This was based on found photography. Um, the found photography photograph is actually in the, in the exhibition as well. Um, a number of people commented that they really liked the red uh, um, shape at the back and that it draw, drew you into to the woman, uh, drew you towards her and the framing of the posts. And also they commented on, on the faces of the children um, saying that they looked quite old. Um, whether that's through life experience or something intentional, I, I don't know. Um, the children are actually myself and my sister, well based loosely on myself and my sister. Um, and uh, I really like the way that the snow looks in this. It's quite, it feels quite fluffy um, with, with a lot of volume in it. Yeah, it's, it is a, one of my favorites, I think. In fact, they're all my favorites, so. Um, so this is a bit of medicine. It is one of the smallest paintings in the show. Um, and it was the one, one that was done over the longest period of time. Um, it was 22 to 23, um, and it was originally for another show, but I loved it so much, um, I thought I would put it in here. And it's actually painted on a very, very old canvas. It can't, well, I say very, very old, but the canvas was originally painted by me in about 2015, and it was a butterfly, um, an abstract butterfly, as I was finding my way into paint. Um, I painted over it recently because it was a nice canvas. And you can almost see the, the butterfly underneath, the kind of um, the marks and lines underneath, which is actually really nice because it brings you towards the children, the child and the, and the um, adult. Some people say it's a really nice painting and they get a really warm feeling about their childhood from it. Other people have said that it's scary, um, the inclusion of the clown and the photographic transfer of the boy who never was makes it um, quite a scary image. But I like it. I think I'll probably have this on my wall at home after the show's done um, because it is a nice nice painting and the, the highlight of the, the white cup sort of brings you towards um, the child as well which is which is interesting. I really like the contrast between the burnt orange in the skirt and the aqua kind of turquoisey of the blanket. Um, there's a lot of volume it seems in that skirt. Um, you'll get a closer look on all the or will have already seen a closer look on the screen. So um, yeah, it's a really interesting contrast there. This is the only painting um, that is actually based on a family photograph, an actual family photograph of mine. Um, this bottom half was based on a family photograph of my father, um, myself and my sister at St. Mary's Bay with my mother taking the picture. Um, and then it's been superimposed or brought together with, with Dungeon S uh, nuclear power station. Very happy memory at the bottom, also very happy memory at the top. Nuclear power station, you may say, why is that happy memory? Um, well, around 2017, I did a um, pilgrimage a Derek, to Derek Jarman's kind of uh, resting place in a church, uh, St. Clement's, I believe it is, and uh, Dungeon S, and it was a really, almost, I wouldn't say magical time, it was a really interesting time where I got to know a lot more about myself and I fell in love with Dungeness and that's kind of why I brought the two together. This is actually a very happy painting compared to some of these which aren't so happy. Um, I'll take you to the next painting which is actually a portrait of Aramis uh, Sivokas um, and the show is dedicated to him and I'll explain why when we look at his portrait. So this is a portrait of Aramis Sivokas. He was one of my very good friends. Um, 
and unfortunately he died uh, in February um, after a, a long, a lifelong battle with addiction, um, leaving his ex-partner and uh, his family and his young son behind. Um, I wanted to dedicate this show to Aramis um, and I painted this, started painting this shortly after I'd heard he died and um, I managed to kind of channel my emotions into, into this portrait. Some people have said that there's a real, um, there's almost a smile on the lips and a sense of um, sadness in the eyes, maybe there is. Maybe that was intentional, maybe it wasn't, but um, I think I captured, I think I captured part of him in, in the painting. Um, and this painting will be gifted to uh, his son and his ex-partner um, after the show has finished. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's nice to be able to dedicate the show to him and to um, have created something in his memory. Let's move on to the next paintings. What we have here is uh, the two, well, the other one painting in this room and the uh, found object here. This is a float on denial. I really love this painting um, and it was originally uh, one of the first in Margate that I was creating when I had a studio in North Down Road. Um, and it's been overpainted a lot. So there are lots of layers in this. This was originally, um, so the, the, originally I'd done an orange wash and then there were some very realistic colors, green um, and the dark blue, which you can sort of see here. And there are hints of the green here. Um, I hated those. I didn't like the way they looked. Um, and I introduced this really kind of bright neon pink um, and then painted over the green with gesso and this is a kind of lurid uh, yellowy green. Um, and then painted, I think I painted the orange first over the blue, the dark blue, and then painted the blue on top. But it gives this really kind of interesting reflection of the sky um, and ties the two sides of the painting, the top and the bottom together, I think. Um, I was also quite, quite influenced by um, Peter Doig. Um, and if you don't know Peter Doig, you need to check Peter Doig out because his work is amazing. His work has often got a sense of unease in it and he uses quite bright and lurid colour color sometimes. There's, there was an amazing painting in the Tate Modern recently which had like a lime green lake. Um, so yeah, this is why I've used the colours um, I've used here. Um, and I'm really happy with this one. I actually wasn't so happy with it to begin with and it's grown, in the exhibition it's actually grown on me, probably because I've been sat um, just over there and had it, had it, and been looking at it and had it looking at me. But I'm really happy with these, this pink kind of fluorescent outline, which does configure in other parts of the show as well. Um, seems to bleed through in some paintings and, and, and others. This young man here is Klaus. Uh, Klaus was actually a found item. Um, a lot of people have asked me, did I have this as part of my childhood? And I was rather vague, but this was actually a found object. And he was originally found in the uh, Mal Park flea market in Berlin, underneath a trestle table in a um, box, and he was really wet. It had been raining and he'd kind of got quite sodden with rain. Um, as he's got a bit of discoloration on his leg where his, his, the colour on his the yarn ran into the other colour, but he was a find and I loved him as soon as I found him. Um, I think I probably showed them that I loved him a bit too much because uh, the price was immediately 25 euros and I probably could have got it for one euro um, if I'd been like a bit more nonchalant about the whole thing but I managed to haggle them down to 20 but I love him I think he's probably one of a kind doesn't have any sort of um, stickers or anything to say that where he was made or he was made in a factory I don't think he was in fact the singlet is like secondarily made and put on top the little uh, bow is as well and the shoes are I believe as well so he's He's a real find and, um, and I do actually love him. He scares quite a lot of people because he's a clown. But um, yeah, he's in the uh, other painting that I showed you earlier, uh, Bitter Medicine. He looks rather unhappy in that painting though, but in this 
circumstance in the gallery. I think he likes it because he's smiling. Uh, we'll move into room number two now. So we are in room number two now. Um, this is a really interesting room because of the tiled walls, the original tiled walls, and I love the way that the paintings look on the tiled walls in here. Um, especially this one, which is almost a hostile kindness. This was also one of the first ones as well with uh, Float on Dinar that I had done in Margate in my North Down Road studios. Um, and I had originally done a wash, I believe it was a yellowish wash on here. I can, you can almost see it kind of coming through underneath. Um, not too sure what the wash was actually, but yeah, this is an exploration of childhood. This is an exploration of um, a, a depiction of me, both of these characters here and me, my uh, person in the window pulling this red uh, rope, which is a nod to the red thread I use a lot in my work. Um, and this young boy going through or helping to pull in the net or searching through the net. Um, and that's myself as well as a child. Um, and this painting is about um, a real need to look through my childhood and to inspect um, the past um, for my work, for, for what I'm doing now, for what I'm doing in this show, really. Um, there are themes of loss in this painting. Um, there are themes of you know, sadness around homophobia. You have the silence equals death, which is a nod to the AIDS crisis in the 80s, which is when I grew up. Uh, repent and be saved up there with the crucifix um, as the message in the 80s was constantly hammered home of you know being gay is an abomination homosexuality is an abomination um ci was here is a nod to colin ireland the serial killer in, in 93 because i grew up with that as well um he killed a lot of gay men um and that was kind of as a child that's really damaging i think um to experience those things and there's a, there's a little drawing up here in the, the top, or well, the left-hand side, and it's just a, um, a smiling young boy with a rainbow above his head. And I think that's all I really wanted as a child, was to kind of just be happy and be uh, left to who I was. And I knew I was gay at nine, so this is quite um, a poignant painting for me. Here there's four figures, and one of them is slightly erased, and that's a kind of a nod to, to losing my father and the way that I dealt with that. Um, of him being ill when I was younger. Um, and there's also the radiotherapy mask here, um, which, was an, which was something very poignant and, and something that I remember very um, well. Uh, and that was his kind of regular trips to hospital for his radiotherapy when he had cancer. So there's a lots of bits and pieces. I'm not gonna go through all of them here, but I do really like this painting. Um, Almost a hostile kindness is, is a nod to you know, people feeling the need to impress that they are trying to save you for your good. Um, and it, it is hostile, uh, but it's wrapped in this like cloak of kindness and kind of, um, I'm doing this for your benefit. And then that's not needed. I mean, my family never tried to change me in that respect, but society generally tries to change, well, in the 80s and 90s, tried to change young gay men and uh, anybody who, who, you know, came across as different in an LGBTQ plus um, sense. So yeah, that's that painting. Um, we'll move over to the bigger one on the wall now. Now this huge work here is probably one of the widest. It's, it seems like one of the biggest, but it's actually not the tallest. It's probably the widest, uh, apart from the landscape in, the, in room number one. This is called, When Did You Last See Your Father? Um, I had a lot of problems with this painting uh, because it just wasn't working for me. I knew what I wanted to do, but I got kind of stuck of how to get there. Um, and it just didn't feel cohesive. Um, the father figure, this is actually the face of my father, was, um, it, it was the, one of the first things to go in. I mean, it's based on two photographs. One was a train um, and this, this person with, a, with one child in the window and uh, the other was this, this huge mountain in the background. And I pushed the two photographs together or, or used them as a compositional structure um, together and created this painting here. Um, it was a real tough one for me and one I didn't look at quite a, for quite a while. Emotionally, it was tough when I was doing it as well. Um, but painting-wise, 
um, trying to get elements of it white was really difficult. Um, I did introduce this very large white, almost bone bleached tree, which helped frame um, the scenario here. And we have uh, the owl again from the first paint, from one of the first paintings. Um, from uh, there is a certainty to melting snow. Um, again, in in here and attached to um, this, my father, this this figure with this red thread, um, which once again runs through the paintings. And then uh, two, two children in the background looking um, sort of forlornly out the, out, out the window of the train. Um, it was a really difficult one, but one I think I, I managed to, in the end, get to master. Um, and I'm really happy with the way it looks. I love this beautiful uh, turquoise, um, blue, kind of, darker blue hued pavement that runs through and the contrast that has with the orange as well. So I am very happy with this. This, this painting actually has been probably one of the most emotional for people to view as well. I've had um, a couple of, well more than a couple, but I've had people um, view the painting and uh, become really upset actually. One of the guys, Robert from Cambridge, came with his wife, randomly came off the street, I think they were just in Margate for the day, and um, came and viewed it and ended up getting quite upset. I think it related, um, it made him think about his father or some kind of ex experience like that. I came back later again in the evening and said that they'd been directing people to the show and he wrote in the book as well, which was lovely. That's a really amazing experience for me and, and things like that make this show worthwhile because it shows that I have connected with people and that's really what I wanted for the show. I wanted to connect with people, get people to think about their experiences. So just next to me, I'm going to grab him now, is the owl. Um, he's the same as Klaus, not from Germany this time, but um, I wanted people to, to question whether this was actually part of my life um, as a child, but he's in fact a found object, um, and he's, he's really nice, he's felt, I think, um, or some kind of material, uh, but he has played a, a part in a couple of the paintings. And I think I got my inspiration for using Klaus and uh, the owl with, uh, from paintings by Paula Rago, um, who uses big stuffed animals sometimes and, and toys um, to, to, to represent people. And I think that's something I'd continue, want to continue to do because I really enjoyed the, um, the, the kind of association with those items. Um, and in this painting particularly, and I mentioned this to a friend recently, um, I'm not too sure whether this is a spectre and this is the re real reality, the, person, the, the, you know, the owl being taken away by the nurse, or whether, you know, vice versa, I'm not sure, um, or the opposite is true. Um, but he has almost a feeling of being a spectre, of this smile, which doesn't fit the scene, um, and then being attached to this owl being taken into an ambulance. Yeah, it's a really interesting painting. It is quite, quite a powerful painting, I think. Um, and colour-wise, it's quite powerful. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I enjoy this painting now. Let's make our way to the painting behind me and then we'll go into room number three. So this is an interesting painting um, because it's not actually... It's probably the only one that doesn't have the facial features of somebody in it. And it's very hard to work out who, who this person is. And it was um, one that stumped a few people. Uh, they couldn't work out what was going on. It's called Offerings at the Pool of Nisemone. And I'm hoping I'm saying that right. But um, she is the goddess of memory. And this was kind of a transitional painting for me. This was more about... Um, my process of using found photography and my process of uh, offering these paintings and the work I do, the artwork I do, as, a, as, a, as gifts to kind of memory. Um, I wanted to make the person in the, in the image nondescript, neither male nor female. Um, there's a possibility because the, the chest is breast-like. This could be a skirt, um, so this could be a, a female or this could be a male, it could be anybody really, non-binary, it could be anyone. Um, there is no face 
Um, so you could impress your own face on this person or you could imagine it to be somebody else. Um, we have the, the pool with photographs, uh, quite orangey red photographs thrown in and a couple of photographs by the leg of the person. Um, and then this hint of yellow in the, in the corner um, of this greenery in this, well, it's say greenery, but it's more of an um, aqua kind of turquoise color. Um, color wise, people have really enjoyed it. Um, but there is, there's been some confusion about what's actually happening, which is fine with me as well. I mean, I don't need, to, I don't need things to be like straightforward and explained all of the time. Um, so I've appreciated the questions that this, this uh, painting has engendered. Um, and yeah, it's been success in the show, I think, uh, because people have spoken about it and wanted to know more, which is good. Um, so we'll just take a quick look at The Boy Who Never Was, and then we'll move into room number three. So this is The Boy That Never Was. Um, this was originally painted for a show, my small show in London, a uh, solo show called Prelude. And this, the show was a, a, a prelude or precursor to this bigger show, um, and that's how I wanted to frame it. This piece was in that show, um, and it contained this young gentleman here who is a construct. He didn't exist in real life, um, and he helped um, by his presence, name the painting, The Boy Who Never Was. Um, he has a red thread wrapped around his wrist with a needle in his arm. Um, and in the background we have the Margate Harbour Arm as well. Um, a lot of people found this painting very poignant. A lot of people found it quite disturbing. Um, there were a lot of questions about who, who is he, why, you know, why is nobody looking at him. Um, maybe he's a constructive uh, or, or a representation of who I could have been, or maybe he's a representation of who um, somebody could have been. Um, he has a very poignant look in his eyes, very sad look in his eyes, but then I also think he wants to be seen. I mean, he, there is a photographic transfer of him in the bitter medicine as well, um, and I think he wants to be seen, hence why he's the only, only, only person in the uh, whole of the image that is looking outwards. Um, everybody else is looking there's a family over there in, in a separate dip, side of the diptych. Um, there's people looking towards the birds who are also almost quite menacing in the, the background, um, but he's being ignored. Um, I do have a, an affinity with him, to be honest, and I, will, what I want to use him in further work, whether that is as a photographic transfer or as a, as a creation. Um, I do think he, he, he is begging to be used in further work um, and to be seen by people and recognised. Um, people, people either love him or hate him is a bit like Marmite, but um, I think he's wonderful. I think he really has a, a character and an energy of his own. And I, I don't look at him as evil, I don't look at him as like angry, I just look at him as like um, a little bit sad that he wants to see people, he wants to be seen by people. So we'll go into the third room now, uh, which is the third room and final room of paintings. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed the tour and we'll conclude in the third room. Thank you. I also wanted to mention this uh, interactive work that I created um, and this is to add another layer to the show and uh, no longer have it just around painting but allow people to get involved um, and get people thinking about their own some things. Um, obviously you can see it says are you going through something and there's some yarn attached to uh, the base here and then up through the painting and into this box. Inside this box is a hagstone um, and that is a stone found on the beach, like usually with a hole in it. Um, and then that's attached to the red thread. And in folklore, a hagstone with red thread wrapped around it is usually a way to dispel evil um, and kind of uh, has magical properties. So I put this inside this uh, box that I, was, that, that I bought from uh, eBay actually, sourced it and then got an old catch, kind of put the lock on it. And I was really worried that people weren't going to engage with this. Um, I didn't know whether people were actually going to feel happy about putting things in this box. And it's actually full, which is a real surprise and uh, almost a delight for me because um, it, was, it was a real worry that nobody was going to actually want to share. And it's full within, I had 150 of these cards and there's virtually none left. Um, if you put your finger in there, it actually so compacted down that um, 
there's going to be a lot to go through. And I wanted to use uh, what I find in this box, I want to use in further paintings. Um, it's all anonymous, no names, um, but this show has been about myself and I want to do future shows about um, other people and their experiences um, and kind of make it a more community thing and possibly hold another show here. So um, that's going to be hopefully the outcome of this, um, this interactive piece here. This is the third and final room in this uh, gallery. Well, this is the third and final room of paintings. There's a, f a further room, a fourth room of um, a projection and, and an uh, archival piece of work. But this is the third and final room of paintings. And this room, it, I wanted these paintings to be together because they are a trio of paintings. Um, this is the beginning of a process the middle of a process and the end or um, kind of the bookmark at the end of the process, uh, which I don't think is ever finished, but I'll explain that, that soon. Um, so this is a Cliff is a Dizzying Place to Meet, the part one, The Call. Um, this was also done in the London studio and then I brought it down and finished it um, down here, um, but I started it up in London. Um, this is a very interesting painting. Um, the basis of this painting was a found negative from Mal Park um, Flea Market again. And originally I thought it was actually a, a female in a bathing suit, a woman in a bathing suit. Um, and I realized on closer inspection, it was actually a male in a bathing suit uh, from the 1930s-ish, maybe 1940s. But very, it's very rare to find something like that, especially with a parasol almost hints of kind of queer photography from the past, um, which I really want, I want to get actually printed and, and framed because I think it's a really interesting image in itself. Um, so this painting is a representation of the moment I found out that my best friend had uh, died, had been found. Um, and it is a very, very emotional painting. Um, there's a look of real sadness and kind of shock in my face. Um, and I have this surrealist edition of this uh, rotary phone, but with no numbers and no cable um, to add kind of that uneasy, uh, bizarre, weird feeling to the painting. Um, there are flowers of remembrance, poppies and uh, forget-me-nots and some other bits uh, at the bottom, the red thread again, um, trampled grass leading down towards the beach, um, and uh, this big expanse of black water, blacky, bluey water in between. Um, I think it works really effectively as a painting. I love the contrast between the, um, the magenta and pinks and the uh, aqua teal kind of combination of the parasol. Um, once again, with this burnt orange, which this, this color combination is, is beautiful. I love it. Uh, I love using it. I'm probably gonna use it in, in more uh, works, to be honest. So this painting here, um, is the world of the peeling moon. Now this painting is a uh, spacer between the two, as it were, um, and this is a picked, uh, pic, uh, depiction of um, a moment when I felt that I was losing grip on reality after I'd heard the news of um, my best friend's death. Um, I felt that I could reach up and peel the moon out of the sky and I felt that there was a shift, um, which was actually quite frightening at the time. I don't know whether I've actually really fully get, gained <laughs> control of, of reality as I had before, um, but it was a really frightening moment and I wanted to depict that moment in this painting. It's in a more surrealist sense. Um, you have uh, some items here that do just a vial of liquid and a red pill on a plate. The eat me, drink me kind of Alice in Wonderland matrix um, nod there. There's some writing of a poem I'd written uh, a few months ago about this exact moment um, on this open book here. And there is a pot of paint um, on the bottom left hand corner, spin me a yarn. Uh, there's a nod to the yarn again without actually putting that, uh, depicting that red thread in there um, and a paintbrush and a circular motion around. Um, there's also a, a little 
Easter egg of uh, the police um, in the distance through the, the break in the wall, um, which was a, from a picture of that moment that he had been found. Um, so yeah, this one's quite poignant as well. I haven't really spent much, much time in this room because I felt quite um, emotional about it, I think. So I haven't really spent much time here. Um, this is the A Cliff is a Dizzying Place to Meet, part two, The Climb. Um, and this is acrylic on canvas. Um, this is kind of the bookend to the show. Uh, and this is a, a taken from found photography. Um, and this is a painting of myself uh, scaling a cliff um, and kind of scaling, uh, climbing out of this uh, emotion and this situation um, and hopefully heading somewhere um, somewhere better, somewhere with more positive kind of energy in a different space. Um, there's a few things in this painting. I love uh, the red, uh, sorry, the pink outlines again and the lurid pink sock outlines and legs. Um, and this is another nod to um, Peter Doig. So it's quite nice that the beginning, one of the beginning paintings is, has that, that pink and one of the end paintings has that pink as well, um, that pink outline. We have a uh, mask. There's a few things wrong with this. We have a mask on the, the head of um, myself, which is a mask from I created in COVID um, and done in a, uh, and used to utilised in a photo shoot in COVID times and, and exhibited. Um, but I'm wearing that mask. I have this red thread again in my backpack, my little backpack. Um, I'm not wearing any shoes, which is rather bizarre if you're climbing a mountain. I guess the precariousness of the mountain and climbing. Um, is shown in the fact I'm not wearing any shoes. And uh, there's almost uh, here, this was intentional, almost you can see the bones in the hand, uh, almost skeletal. Um, and that was uh, just to show kind of, I guess, my own mortality, um, my own vulnerableness, um, and nothing's for certain. And then some, an addition of uh, some, some snowdrops, um, which were my grandmother's, uh, or one of my grandmother's favorite flowers, and I, and I inherited a little glass snowdrop from her and I wanted to sort of put a nod uh, to that in there and that's from hope, uh, snowdrops mean hope and also I found out snowdrops uh, in, in uh, an, an essence, oil essence person came in and said they mean grief as well um, which is, which is uh, another layer added to it that I didn't know before. Um, so yeah this is the a cliff is a dizzying place to meet part two the climb um, and I'm really glad the, this is the end painting in the show uh, I think it's kind of a, a good bookend to have with the beginning one of a float on denial as well. Uh, so this is room number three. So this is the final room, the fourth room in the uh, exhibition. Um, and this is a piece that was originally shown in 20. 19, I believe, in um, Edinburgh in the Dundas Street Gallery. Um, and this is called I Remember Roadmap. Um, and it, I Remember slash Roadmap. And this is a exploration of, in a photographic piece, of um, all of the scars and marks upon my face um, and, a, and a poem around the outside um, detailing where those scars and marks came from. Um, this is probably one of the most poignant pieces uh, from, from that time and it was when I first started using this red thread as well and, and stitching works um, and you can see that there's actually the um, upholsterer's needle here as well uh, to give you kind of context of where this thread comes from, almost a, a visceral kind of painful object that could cause some more damage really so um, I, the addition of this really I think brings the, the piece together as well and using the red thread. A lot of people have commented on this work and said that they really like it um, and that they think it's a really powerful piece and I, and I do as well and I, I wanted to include it in, in the work because ultimately the red thread runs through a lot of the paintings and I wanted to show a physical use of that thread as kind of an ender to the show. Um, I've also got, a, you might be able to see it slightly behind me, I've also got a projection of painting um, from the Cliff is a Dizzying Place to Meet, part two, The Climb, uh, the, the last painting in the show. Um, and it's a seven minute video of the, um, of the painting process, which I'll attach, to the, uh, I'll attach a short, shorter version to the end of this, um, this tour. 
Um, yeah, it's been a really successful show, I believe. Um, I've had a lot of uh, engagement and people talking about how they made it, how it's made them feel. I've had a lot of engagement with the, the interactive assemblage sculpture piece. Um, and for me, creating this work, it's not about selling and it's not about um, kind of how many pieces I've sold, it's how many people have taken something away from this. Um, I think that's the, the amazing thing about art, it's the power to connect um, and attach uh, meaning to our lives um, and find meaning to our lives um, through the artwork of others. So um, if I've helped people connect with their emotions or connect with an experience or just generally connect with art, then this has been a, a successful show um, and I've really enjoyed the whole process. Um, so please now watch a little bit of the uh, painting process for A Cliff is a Dizzying Place to Meet, A Cliff is a Dizzying Place to Meet Part 2 The Climb, and um, thank you for watching this video.